Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Chapter 5 of Book 5 of the Brothers Karamazov has Fyodor Dostoevsky putting a poem, so to speak, in the mouth of Ivan Karamazov, a poem called The Grand Inquisitor. And in it, the Grand Inquisitor is telling Christ, who has reappeared and has been arrested, how Christ made mistakes in understanding and dealing with and addressing human nature. When Christ could have actually made all of humans happy, he didn't do so. Instead, he gave them freedom, and the Grand Inquisitor and his colleagues are going to improve upon the work of God. And in doing so, they take as their cues the three temptations of Christ in the desert. The first temptation is that of bread. And so it's getting a little bit of a reinterpretation. Uh, he says, decide who was right. You were the one who questioned you then, the devil. Recall the first question. Its meaning, though not literally, was this. You want to go into the world and you are going empty handed with some promise of freedom, which they, human beings, in their simplicity and innate lawlessness, cannot even comprehend, which they dread and fear. But do you see these stones in this bare, scorching desert? Turn these stones into bread and mankind will run after you like sheep, grateful and obedient, though eternally trembling, lest you withdraw your hand and your loaves cease for them. So this is the temptation and it, it's reworking. It's no longer just Christ being tempted to turn uh, stones into bread so he can eat after 40 days of fasting in the desert where he must have been pretty hungry, right? Instead, it's do this for humankind. And you could say, well, wait a second, in the, the biblical stories in the Gospels, didn't he, in fact, like multiply the loaves and fishes? And you could say, yes, th that he did. He multiplied them. He didn't just simply do, hey, presto, turn this into that. Well, what about the wine and the water? And, and we can quibble if we want about this. Dostoevsky, of course, knows the Gospels just as well as anybody else. It's not really about doing it in a one-time thing. Instead, it would be doing it for human beings continually, across the board, systematically, changing their, their lives as a result. And so this is about satisfying bodily needs, primarily those of hunger, but we could read other things in here as well. And Christ rejects earthly bread for freedom and what we can call heavenly bread. That's, that's a reference point in here. What is heavenly bread? It doesn't mean manna or anything like that. It means spiritual nourishment and fulfillment and you know, the Grand Inquisitor says, you really made a mistake here. You did the wrong thing. I understand why you did it. Well, at least I think I understand. But you didn't do what you should. He says, had you accepted the loaves, you would have answered the universal and everlasting anguish of human beings as an individual being and of the whole of mankind together. And we're going to come to that in just a bit. It could have given satisfaction to human needs <clears throat> and thereby received obedience. This is a term that he uses over and over again. The one who has the bread will have obedience from the human beings who want the bread. There's a point where he says, um, you know, they would have laid their freedom at, at, at somebody's feet and said, better you enslave us, but feed us, right? So this is a, a 
common human problem. I mean, many people are starving, hungry, even in the, the, the developed world. And you can say, well, what's the cause of that? And Dostoevsky would say, well, I mean, there's a lot of causes. Could be infertile soil, could be this and that. But in first world countries, it's actually human freedom. That's the cause of it. There are, there are people who have enough and could give to somebody else and don't do it. And then people starve and die in the street. So this is something really worth thinking about. He talks about human approaches to this problem, uh, this ever-present problem of need or desire for things that we, we need in order to satisfy ourselves, like bread. And he, he says that if you give people food, they will give up their freedom by following. And he's got a number of places where he talks about this. He says, um, here we go. Um, you object man does not live by bread alone, but you do know that in the name of this very earthly bread, the spirit of the earth will rise against you and fight with you and defeat you. The spirit of the earth being either the devil or being just the way things work in this world. And everyone will follow him exclaiming, who can compare to this beast for he has given us fire from heaven? Do you know centuries will path and mankind will proclaim with the mouth of its wisdom and science? There is no crime and therefore no sin, but only hungry people. That's another point there, right? It's not just about giving up freedom. Some people will say, listen, human nature, the way things work, we're animals, we need to eat. And so if somebody is depriving us or those who we care about of food, it's perfectly fine to go take that food from them. It's, it's fine to distribute it. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> that would be doing something good for the species, you could say, not just for your own. And so <clears throat> he goes on and he says, feed them first, then ask virtue of them. This is what they will write on the banner they will raise against you, meaning Christ, by which your temple will be destroyed. And then he talks about a new tower of Babel it being raised again in place of your temple. And he says, though like the former one, this one will not be completed either, you could have avoided this new tower and shortened people's suffering by a thousand years. You could have cut out all of this crazy, crappy time of people starving to death while other people have you know, more than they possibly need. Seeing food rotting when it could be going to feed the many who are hungry. We should talk a little bit about what the Tower of Babel means for those who aren't familiar with that metaphor. So this comes out of Genesis. And the idea was that a great tower would be raised that would go all the way to the heavens and God comes along. This is actually a really interesting story. It's very short. Um, God comes along and says, wow, look at this thing. Who knows what these human beings are going to try to do if they pull this one off? And what we have here is a God who's really not that omnipotent, right? Or maybe he's just kind of joking around. We, we don't really know how to interpret the story. And so he, he destroys the tower, and at that time in the world, human beings all had one language. So he confuses the languages so that they can't do that again. And confusing the languages is, in a way, to confuse not just our capacity to communicate, but our capacity to coordinate, to be on the same page. So when it comes to hunger, how do we deal with hunger? Well, there's lots and lots of plans, and they're very often compatible at certain points and incompatible at other points. But people will raise this new Tower of Babel, which will be a way of providing for, for everybody. And the Grand Inquisitors uh, take over. Well, the entire Inquisition, the entire church takes this over, he says, um, it is to us they will come suffering after a thousand years of their tower. They will seek us out again, um, and they will find us and cry out, Feed us, for those who promised us fire from heaven did not give it. And then we'll finish building their tower. For not only he who feeds them will finish it, 
Uh, only he who feeds them will finish it, and only we shall feed them in your name, for we shall lie that it's in your name. We're going to say, oh, this is our Christian duty, we'll feed you, and everybody will have enough, but it's not really going to be about that. It's not about Christianity. It's really about finishing this Tower of Babel, bringing humanity together in one project, ending this sort of perennial conflict between human beings over resources. And the inquisitors know some things. And this is what the Grand Inquisitor tells Christ. He knows the weakness of most human beings. He says, listen, you came for the strong. You came for those who could live on heavenly bread and not earthly bread. He says, you didn't want to deprive human beings of freedom. Uh, what sort of freedom is it you reasoned if obedience is bought with loaves of bread? And there are some people, he thinks, who are up to that challenge and will be able to you know, stick with Christ and, and what you might say the project, the plan, and do so freely, give their love freely. But most human beings can't do that, the Grand Inquisitor says. Most human beings, he says, are incapable of being free because they're feeble, depraved, non-entities, rebels. This is an etern a weak, eternally depraved, and eternally ignoble human race. And he says, if in the name of heavenly bread, thousands and tens of thousands follow you, what will become of the millions and tens of thousands of millions of creatures who will not be strong enough to forego earthly bread for the sake of the heavenly? Don't, do you care about them at all? We care about them. You don't seem to care. You only care about the small number of people who are going to be able to follow your path. We're actually looking out for the masses. We're the good guys here. He also says that they know that freedom and earthly bread in plenty for everyone are incompatible. Why? Because human beings on the whole are jerks. There's always going to be some idiot who decides that they should spoil the bread supply just out of rancor. There's always going to be some greedy person hoarding flour, hoarding bread, hoarding whatever it happens to be, gumming up the, the methods of, of not just production, but uh, distribution so that they can have more than other people. So, you know, if you allow human beings to have freedom, you're not going to be able to feed everybody. And notice he doesn't just say earthly bread for everyone, like we all get the same crappy you know, little bread ration with pebbles in it. He says earthly bread in plenty. We're never going to have a society in which most people can actually, actually not just most, all people can be properly fed and all their other bodily needs can be taken care of unless we find some way to get rid of human freedom or to use freedom in such a way that it turns on itself. He also says, and this is very interesting, and this is the lead into the next temptation, that human beings, and here we come back to you know, what it is that would have been revealed, he says, you would have answered the universal and ever, everlasting anguish of, of human beings as individual beings and the whole of uh, humankind altogether, namely, before whom should I bow down? There is no more ceaseless or tormenting care for the human being so long as they remain free than to find someone to bow down to as soon as possible. So one way to know who to bow down to is who feeds you, who takes care of you, who sustains you. And the Grand Inquisitor and his colleagues and their operation or organization is answering that question. We will feed you, not that Christ person over there who we'll, we'll talk about and, you know, maybe worship in some sort of way, but it's going to be us distributing the bread to you. It's going to be us making sure that everyone gets their fair share. It's going to be us. Give up your freedom to us and we will take care of your bodily needs. And so what they're doing is creating a new society based on this understanding. And they are teaching this understanding to the many, to the crowd, to the weak, telling them, it's okay, you can, you can give up your freedom because we're going to take care of you and they will do so. So this is what the first temptation reveals to us. This is a vital dimension 
of the society that the Grand Inquisitor is envisioning and working towards.